is slightly concave. You can hear the glue. This isn't as good as I would like it to be. I just need to spend a little more time. Okay. Right, now we've nearly got that. It's concave in there. I'll use this hybrid skew chisel of mine to get further in here now. Nearer and nearer to that chuck, that ring centre. So this now is slightly concave through here, or should be. We'll just try. Yep, we're fine. So now. Okay. There's just a little bit that needs easing out of the centre there now. And that's alright. We'll just take this out. And I believe. Yes, yes. This little flex cut um, uh, carving tool. Gee, that's, there's a fault in there somewhere. In that factor. We'll bring that back. And just ease that little centre out of here. I made the mistake of putting that hole in there, as you know, before I came here. And I have to deal with it, that it's coming out. And you would just, if you couldn't get that blended in properly, you'd just take a little um, uh, Velcro disc in there and just ease it out, soften it out. Now there's still a little centre in there. If I take it all out, we'll probably be through the bottom of the bowl. But that's just one way of finishing them off. I, as I say, I don't normally do that. These are into belt, into um, vacuum chucked situation with this because it's got worm holes in it we'd have had to have put tape over those holes obviously the air the chuck that I use pulls four and a, cu four and a half cubic feet a minute with holes like that you'd want to chuck that pulls about ten cubic feet a minute to make up with the loss of air so to speak then in America in or Ireland has got one that pulls 21 cubic feet a minute and he'll turn pieces that got inch holes in it but it will still hold it because it's pulling the air fast enough to hold it in situation. But that's the sort of situation that we've, we've got. They, well, you could have dropped it and I could have blamed you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's briefly that factor. What I'll just touch on here, um, I'll just pick up one or two of these pieces and just talk about the materials uh, that are used in these. Right, before you do that, yeah. on this one here, when you were talking about your finishing schedule, your sanding, yes. was that going to be for the gallery or utilitarian? It's in the halfway house situation, that piece. It, it, fit, it can tick both boxes. Some <laughs> galleries will take that, that piece because of the figure and so forth within it, and it's a very pleasing shape in the hat. It's very tactile, but it could function just as easily. It, it fits into both categories. Really. So, on your functional ones, do you also say them to 400? On the domestic utilitarian pieces, I go down power sand to 240 grit and hand sand to 320 grit. On the, these type of bowls that I've got in my hand here are down to 500 grit. That's where these are. Uh, it, years ago, I used to make my domestic utilitarian pieces down to 400 grit. And I used to do that. And people say, they're too well finished to use, so they wouldn't use them. So I thought, well, they're made to use, so I... I decided to make them not quite as refined, if you like, in the sanding technique. My dear friend Richard Rathman said to me one day, Richard and I have known one another a heck of a long time, and uh, uh, he, Richard hates finishing. That's the one thing he hates. He never goes below 240 grit of race. That's as far as he goes. He had always hated it, and everything he makes is for use. That's the way he sees it. It's all for domestic utilitarian use problems. Anyway, one day he was telling me, and he likes to do these things to, to try and wind you up and see if you rise to his bait, so to speak, which I seldom do. And he says, you know that bowl of yours? I said, I don't know what you've got in mind with you. You've got several of my pieces. Sort of thing. And he says, the one with the shape top, that Indian rosewood piece. I said, oh, I forgot one. Anyway, he says, a damn sight better piece now than when I had it from you. So I said, what do you mean by that? He says, oh, I was looking for something to make mustard in the other day. And he said, I mixed it up and it got rid of that goddamn awful finish you put on 
what is it to leave them on the hell you like with it? It's your ball, it doesn't bother me, so to speak. Because he thought I'd get all upset about it, but that doesn't bother me. He can do what the heck he likes. So there you go. Anyway, I'm just pulling these pieces out because they're all in different woods or something. Okay. This particular wood here, which if I could only work one wood in the rest of my life, this would be my choice. This is massa birch that comes from Finland. There is a trade in it. The trade worldwide comes from Finland. It grows up near the Arctic Circle. It grows <coughs> in Siberia also, Sweden and Norway up in the Arctic Circle area. But the trade is from Finland. This isn't a particularly well-figured piece of it. Um, this here is, is better figured. There's more, oops, there's more figure in this little box here of this wood. Now, the textbooks will have it that the, the formation of this grain uh, figure in here is caused by the larvae of a beetle. You talk to the Scandinavians and they'll tell you that's a load of nonsense. They'll tell you that that malfunction, mal, that pattern is caused by the stunted growth growing near the Arctic Circle. It's the extreme cold and extreme um, the summer growth burst, if you like, against the extreme uh, weather conditions in the winter. What it is, it's a wonderful material. It doesn't get particularly large. The largest log I've ever seen of it is 15 inch diameter. The best logs of it, for figure point of view, are normally in the 6 inch to 8 inch diameter. That's where the best figure is. Now, once they go a bit bigger, they're not quite as spectacular in their figure. Although I've got two logs at the moment which are 12 inch diameter, which are way better than this, way, way better. A particularly good figure actually. Uh, it's expensive wood, it gets sold for veneer basically, it peel veneer, so it's in hotel foyers and boardrooms and stuff like that, that's what happens with it for panelling. Um, it's also sought after by the, the, the knife makers in Scandinavia, they buy it for the handles over there because it can be spectacular with grain on it. But the, it, that wood doesn't have any license, what I mean by that is it's a pleasure to turn. It doesn't check up in drying. I've used the pith core in more pieces than I care to remember in hollow vessels and open vessels and in some bowls anyway. There's only one piece that's ever star shaped uh, from the glue pump. And what I do with them when I rough them out, I spot glue that in the centre pith core with the thin CA glue on the inside and on the outside. But it dry it grows so slowly that it doesn't get the radial star shapes within that pith core. It's always sound, that's what I found with it. So, I'm, um, when you sand this, there's no, no, no dust that's a problem. It dries beautifully. Every element of that, it's silky under the tool. It's a pleasure to use. And if I, there was only wooden wood in the world that I could use the rest of my life, that would be my choice. But it is an expensive wood. Mm -hmm. By the contrast of that, this little bowl here. What, which what's is the name of that? Uh, Massa Birch, M A S U R. This one here, by contrast, is a piece of wood that I couldn't care less if I ever turned it ever again in my life. I will, because I've got a lot of it, and it's spectacular in its colour and its markings and so forth. I've always described it, it has the figure of Rio Rosewood and the colour of Macassar Ebony, but it's zero coated, and that will not take a shave. If you come out of the workshop looking as though you've been down a coal mine, it takes dust if in the humidity of this country. I did a demo once down in Fort Lauderdale, and it was 98 degrees and it was 90 odd percent humidity. And they had ordered a piece of this wood in specially for me to turn from craft supply. It was full of cracks in it for, for a start. And I had to hold it together with CA glue and turn it because they had brought it in. And it was a nightmare scenario situation. They had a mini and a lathe that they just bought in, which was a, a Mickey Mouse lathe that they assembled before my eyes that night, so to speak. It had never been switched off. The thing rattled around like this. The whole thing was a nightmare. And I went into the washroom and I looked as though I'd been down the coal mine because it was just the dust had just stuck to me. This only comes off in dust and chippings. But the end product of it, <coughs> the figure of it, and so forth, is wonderful. <coughs> but it's not pleasurable. Those two are extreme. This one is the most pleasurable. This is one of the least pleasurable. And what's the name of this? This is Zero Coating. Z E R I C O T E. It comes mostly out of 
um, Central America, that's where it comes from. And I was in, where was it, St. Louis, about 10 years ago, and there was a timber dealership in there, and out the back, there must have been 20 locks of this Zero County in this extreme heat, and absolutely shocked to my head. There was a fortune's worth of people down there, and I said to the time, I said, what a wicked waste of that material. He says, if we get two or three guitar backs out of it, we've traveled our money many times over in that, you know, that time. That was all they were looking for. So they could waste 90% of it and still be ahead of the game. And they didn't take care of that as long. It sickened me to see the way they were doing it, but there, that's another story. This material here, this is Zero Coated. Uh, sorry, Coca Bola. So is this. This is Coca Bola. Uh, this is one of the, the more figured rosewoods. This is. Um, a wood that I love to use, but a lot of people find that they can't use it. There are enzymes within that that affect a lot of people. Of all the Delbergias or Rosemans out there, that is the one that gives most people the problem from a health issue. Um, what it does, it acts almost like food poisoning. Your eyes close, it puffs up the eyes here, your arms will swell and all the rest of it. But some people just can't use it. There's two of my friends I finished up with all their coca bottles because they couldn't use it anymore. Fortunately, it doesn't affect me. I have a log at home that that one came out of, which is 16 inch diameter, and it was 10 feet long. I bought that about five years ago. And that's a good size for coca bottles. It's a lovely material. The best of it comes out of Mexico as well. It comes out of Honduras and... Uh, where are we? Uh, you had a piece. Uh, where was it? Costa Rica. Spot, Puerto Rico. Best thing that normally comes out of Mexico. Yes. After you've rough these, how long do you wind up having to have those sit? They don't, they're not that long because you never get the moisture content in those woods in South, the South American hardwoods. It isn't like the, the northern temperate woods. There isn't that moisture content in the yes. first place. But they are oily. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Um, Zero coke, uh, sorry, coke bowler is a very oily material. And if I use that glue plot method that I've <coughs> just done here, I would degrease this with acetone before I glued it. Acetone is the degreasing agent for it, and then it will glue. Um, but it's a lovely material to work. It works well for an exotic because it's very greasy. It's got that oily tendency. Um, Brazilian tulip wood, um, where are we going? Uh, Indian rosewood, uh, parakin, king wood. Brazilian tulip wood, they're all Delbergian. So is um, uh, Madagascar rosewood, and there's one or two others which won't come to mind. But there's only about seven of them. There's about ten true rosewood Delbergians, if you will, out there. But the coca bowler is probably the one that finds the most favour in the buying public's mind. Um, almost all of Bill Hunter's work is made from uh, uh, coca bowler, basically. But what it does do, it darkens down. You cut this on the bandsaw, the sawdust you get there, and you walk back in there half an hour later, the end of that board has changed colour within half an hour. Uh, but these pieces, they will still keep, this was much lighter when it was first turned, but because of the variegation of the dark streak and so forth, it has still got a character that maintained. But we're back to the situation of... Um, I love to work flamboyant materials. I love the material itself. All my work is based on simple form, utilising the, the, the figure of the wood primarily. I've never gone into the painting, burning, piercing, whatever. You know, I'm one of the traditionalists, if you like. I love the material. 